located in Dunedin, mm. um, but we're aiming for nationwide. We don't make a product for the Dunedin marketplace. And I can hear us in the cans, which means we are live. Looking at the Jace. Big thumbs up. Tony Satorius, filmmaker extraordinaire, joining us in the Department of Conversation. Welcome. Thanks for coming in. G'day. Thanks for having me. We were just talking about, well, I think we should continue this conversation because what we're trying to do here is um, almost a new form, certainly not unique to the world, but maybe unique to New Zealand, a new form of broadcasting and the way yeah. media is going in the digital space. It's exciting, isn't it? And you have uh, just completed, or have, are completing the Helen Kelly documentary, Helen Kelly Together. Mm. Um, which I watched yesterday. Thank you for the screen. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. Um, is, is that for release on the big screen? We had another documentary maker in this week, and I was unaware that his film festival film is actually going to TVNZ Sunday night show, but they're showing it on oh, the big yeah. screen for the film festival. Yours is big screen adapted, big screen in the end? Well, it's designed for that. I suppose yeah. we're making a virtue of necessity in a way. Tully's not interested at the moment. Um, I think New Zealand TV is in a bit, of a, a bit of a frightful state, to be honest. It's changing so quickly. It may well change by the time the film's ready for TV, but uh, right now it's... Uh, it's designed for the big screen, which what? is good anyway. I actually think that's a good place for it. Well, it's interesting. I was just talking to someone today who is also a documentary maker, um, still saying, though, if you want to get that reach, TV is the place to be. Like, if you want the most number of eyes on it, oh, for sure. TV is the place to be. So Just, with with this story... But what, about, but what about things like streaming services? You know, these days, things like Netflix, because... The yeah. super, super, super niche can reach millions of people because it's just there to be clicked on on Netflix. I think that's different to talking worldwide versus a niche New Zealand story like what you're talking with. Yeah, see, I, don't, I don't know about that. I mean, you know, I think it's, you know, in the same way that, that your show is not a niche Dunedin show, you know, I mean, no. just because it's from here. Yeah. I mean, you know, every, every Western nation has had quite a similar experience to New Zealand's, I think. I think that many countries are interested, actually, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if all, at all if it went well overseas. That'd be, that's amazing. It's, like I said, it's really, really interesting. We'll get more into the documentary as we go through, I'm sure. Um, but I think it was on the spin-off, one of those newsroom websites, talking about the potential death of TV3. There mm. is actual talk going around that TV3 might be disappearing and we'll be just left with, I guess, our um, pay to wear channel on the, like a sky platform or the state broadcaster and tvnz's in a power of shit as well i mean i don't know if you heard about this but their board announced last week that they're not going to make a profit for the foreseeable future um you know they're effectively a non-profit as a business model it's collapsed yeah um i think that's good news myself i think that there's actually a, a, a wonderful opportunity there and new zealand's particularly well placed to take advantage of it because most of our programming has been taxpayer funded forever that's uh, in the beginning though wasn't tvnz kind of said tvnz was not supposed to make money though was it oh really? you know it's always been in, required to deliver a, 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 a dividend a, a dividend yeah, yeah. so they, they give them a, a chunk of 25 million or 250 million or 175 billion or whatever and then they <laughs> and then zero. and then tvnz <laughs> gives them a return back to the government which is yeah. which has been in profit yeah totally. because i remember when i worked as a talkback host there was always conversations about oh you know giving money to make television shows and stuff but at that stage which was you know best part of 10 years ago now mm. the response from me would always yeah but they, they return a profit back to the government so mm. but now that's not the case no and won't be for the foreseeable future but that's you say that oh, well, did, no, did you say it's a good thing it could be an interesting no, thing because i, thing. I, I mean we really had we had tvnz7 mm. for a while and the thing i loved about tvnz7 was you weren't worried about the eyes eyeballs mm. on it you weren't mm. worried about the commercial you were just worried about interesting stories well, that's what i'm talking about yeah. that's being a public broadcaster right now new yeah. zealand hasn't had a public broadcaster and in, in television for well, if it ever has, not for many, many years, certainly not for 30 years. So, I mean, NZBC. Well, I, yeah, I guess, you know, and, and it was so long ago. We look at the programs and they're all black and white and seem really old timey. But if they'd modernized along with, you know, the rest of culture, I think we'd be in a pretty good place now. Well, isn't, isn't it actually that I think uh, almost these days is actually uh, Moldy TV is actually yeah. generating some of the best yeah. local um, documentary content and stuff because they, they're true. not about bottom lines, they're actually That's about right. getting probably telling people stories well, i think i saw it on your facebook page i haven't read it yet so maybe mm. this is what we're talking about mm. the uh, some merger potentially coming between tvnz rnz and maori television is this this is the conversation it's, it's being floated around yeah. but actually just to switch back to tv3 you mentioned before yeah. you know they're in so much trouble at the moment that their biggest show love island has had to be deferred for a year because yeah. they can't find an advertiser for it yeah i mean that's their number one property you know and it, and it can't happen 
um, it's a state of collapse. And, and that's, like I said, I reckon it's good because I've always felt that having a, a, a commercial kind of business model in between publicly funded television and, and an audience is, is not a good model. It doesn't serve audience as well. Mm. So we have now an, an opportunity just to bypass the butt part that's dying and I, I think the future is bright that's interesting as well i think about the idea of uh, the state broadcaster i think obviously the the model around the world is the bbc mm. and bringing rnz in under tvnz and having some kind of overall model could actually involve then several radio stations that oh, provide uh you know mu- like like radio one radio two in the bbc world and actually it doesn't sound like a terrible idea i mean the idea the I don't watch television, meaning broadcast TV. Yeah, I watch television programs. Um, I watch them all yeah. on the internet, yeah. on some special websites, yeah, yeah, like yeah. a lot of people do. Yeah, and there's no adverts, there's no, no nothing. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I actually really like the. Um, I'm going to call it the Living Channel HGTV Channel 17 on Freeview. What's I'm that called? Familiar. Me and my 10-year-old watch renovation shows on it. Oh, cool, yeah. But I have to say, as soon as the ads come on, I'm just like, oh, God, that's why I don't watch television Yeah, it's, a, it's incredibly horrible, isn't it? Yeah. You know, so I had a chat with some broadcasting students in Christchurch about this last week. There's, there's, I think, a very important principle that people need to understand is that when it comes to commercial media and commercial television especially, yeah. Yeah. we, the viewers, are not the, the customers for that business. We're, we're the product. You know, the, the actual nature of it isn't, isn't designed to be what people want. Everyone thinks it is. They think yeah. that's the great virtue of it. You know, it's designed to be popular. What it's designed to do is to be able to sustain a whole bunch of seven-minute little blipverts and bring you back after the ads. You know, it's like it's like televisual clickbait. They invented that concept. I remember that's what I was saying. I think when we're talking about social media with Simon, with Simon, is, yeah. is that no, sorry, not with Simon, with um, our board, boring phone guy. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I forgot his name. But Alex that, Davidson, Alex the boring, that, yeah, boring phone yeah, yeah. That's is the name that, of, hang on, just like, that's <laughs> the, the name of the boring documentary. No, 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 that's, that's, <laughs> I was going to say, so I, I got that you didn't get it. That's the actual name of his oh, product. Oh, good. It's, <laughs> a smart, <laughs> it's a smartphone nice. that acts, um, with it, with which you don't get addicted to because it hasn't got social media. It's oh, called fantastic. The Boring Phone. Oh, yeah. so yeah. I have heard of it. Mine is phone being boring. But yeah, I was just saying, yeah, if anything, if some, if if you if something is free, you're the product. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, I mean, I, I think the, the important point is that it actually changes what it is. It doesn't just change, you know, the business model. It actually changes the content model. A film like mine wouldn't work in that form just simply because if you stopped it every seven minutes, that it wouldn't sustain emotionally. You know, well, it couldn't, that, act, couldn't actually work. It's in interesting. That I, I'm I'm finding this more and more fascinating because the genesis of what what we're doing right yeah, what I'm yeah, doing yeah. started when actually I was on the TVNZ website. Mm. And I was watching a news clip. I'm a bit of a news junkie. And the video clip they gave me was literally seven seconds. <laughs> and, and I went, I, I can, I understand people say we're having a smaller and smaller, you know, the ability to, to pay attention. But I can handle more than seven seconds. It's bullshit. It is bullshit. So this is what's happening offshore. Yeah. Long form conversations are coming yeah. back. And that's kind of part of the genesis of what we're wanting to do we just want to have interesting i mean martima davidson green party co-leader uh was in the other day they've just put our conversation up on her kind of official facebook page mm. and basically she was saying we get five second sound bites every other place but in this one we're talking about you know yeah. my family and and my policies and yes i did confirm that trump is a racist and so it gives us the chance to talk through anything and everything and and like you're here to talk about your documentary and already we're talking about public broadcasting and it's happy to talk about anything we're just talking about whatever we want you know but i just think it's fun it's it's uh, absolutely one of the weaknesses of this is people go who's your demographic you know we're not the tech podcast no our demographic is people who like interesting conversations well you can kind of make two observations right i mean you know the second highest rating tv network in new zealand now is netflix right right which has no ads and has some really long form material on it right and it isn't blipverts i mean if 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 that if that old piece of shit thing people say that people only like little tiny short things was true yeah netflix would be all full of three minute long programs yeah but it's not yeah you know a lot of it's really long you know like 40 50 minutes with no ads and people just sit there and you know, well, and, it's the, and it's the demand thing as well because i actually know sometimes and I, I wonder if something's wrong with me probably is where i'm watching netflix and i'll start watching a mo- i've always wanted to watch this movie and i'll put on and i'll push play yeah. and six minutes later i'll go nah, and i'll go back and i'll find something else i i do watch the whole lot of it but sometimes i find myself even on netflix flicking around around but 
um, the on-demand thing is so good because then I go, okay, I feel like I'm ready for that movie now and I yeah. go back to it and I go from minute six to minute 96 and watch the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, well, I think so. You know, the other thing is my son, who's 17, never watches telly. Like, I don't think most of his mates do either. Mm. They all go for YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And on YouTube, they watch um, content similar to this and you know other things, people talking to each other, and most of it is really long. Yeah. You know, he'll sit there for an hour, hour and a half watching people just kind of talking about stuff. Yeah. Well, I actually saw a video just yesterday about um, advertising on YouTube and YouTube themselves are actually going for that because yeah. um, this, this this person was um, breaking down the advertising revenue they get. Mm. And recently, or not recently, but semi-recently, YouTube um, allowed co- allowed content creators to um, insert where an ad break will be in the video. So the video will yeah. just pause, they'll play an ad, and it'll come back. And when you and so YouTube in, introduced that when you go over ten minutes, you're allowed to insert more than one. Yeah. And so what she found was that. One of her really popular videos that had like 2.5 million views made her about $750. And a video that got 300,000 views, um, which had a couple of ads in it, but a much more, um, her, the demographic of that video was much older, made her like $4,000. Mm-hmm. So a tenth of the views, but five times more money. Well, it's like targeted advertising. It's like who are the important people. That's, that's like, <coughs> pardon me, if you get views on YouTube in the US, typically you receive more ad revenue than if it was in Australia. There's a there's a, a, a higher charge on those groups of people. Mm. Yeah, I think I wonder if I worked in radio for a long time, and when I was working in radio, the the UK and America were going to um, digital DAB in the UK mm. and things like Sirius in in the US. Mm. And I remember thinking and saying publicly that we would never have digital radio in New Zealand because what has to happen is you have to have a digital product that then gets put in cars, that then has a longevity to, over the next 10 years, spread through everyone. You know, you buy the second-hand car that's now 10 years old, that's got the D, the, the DAB player in it, mm. and we're not big enough for it, and, and I said we'd go straight to internet, and that's kind of what's happened. Mm. I wonder if the TV markets are a bit the same here in New Zealand, in that they don't seem to have caught on to how to do it digitally, and whatever the next iteration is going to be is actually where they'll be. I don't know what it's going to be. When I was in radio, I could see it. I'm not in television, so I don't know what it's going to be. And I just wonder if the rest of the world... So, so this kind of show in the US, mm. these styles of show, podcast, live stream, broadcast, they're bigger than the cable news networks. Yeah. And, and it's not that's not happening in New Zealand. But I, I wonder if whatever next, yeah. like the TV here will leapfrog this moment yeah. and go to whatever's next and that's where they'll 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 end up well I, I think i mean you know we have a very big role here for um basically government agencies you know who have funded a lot of the content traditionally yeah they're, they're trying to adjust and to keep up but i mean it's a it's I, I think a slightly misconceived concept that they should try to pick the winners i think it would be a better idea for them to to let people like us do that and then kind of follow behind and, and, you know, back people once they've actually connected with an audience, you know. I mean, there should be a balance. Just having numbers shouldn't be everything. It should also be about, you know, what we're contributing culturally. Mm. Someone has to make some sort of assessment about that. But, you know, with those two things in mind, you know, that, that should be supported. It ought to be viable. Because there is obviously also that pay model is now acceptable, whether mm. it be Amazon Prime or, as we've said, Netflix or HBO's bringing things out or whatever that is. Mm. Um, but there's also something in between, which is, um, that's my cell phone, sorry, that was my fault, because I'm unprofessional. Um, there's in, the, all in the film industry, that's called being slabbed, and you owe everybody on the crew a beer. Yeah, oh, yeah but winning. It's, awesome. my, it's, my, it's only if it's not the host. <laughs> Everyone else can do it. Uh, they, they would apply to the director, and the director is normally the one that gets slabbed. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the reason, for example, Sky's got it wrong, is that you have a paid product there, but then it's also fucking full of ads as well. So it's like they're trying to double dip in there and you, you can't have it one way. You have, you kind of can't have the best of both worlds. Well, I, I think, you know, as I said before, if you have a commercial, a traditional commercial television model, it actually changes the content drastically. And so I, therefore I think that there's a whole bunch of um, broadcast professionals in New Zealand who think they know what the public want, mm-hmm. but they only know it through this very, very narrow little lens of, you know, a, a, a broken up by ads every few minutes sort of model of what TV can be like. Mm. If it doesn't have to be that way, um, I think that people want a much more diverse range of things, you know, and, and that's starting to become evident now. And it would be nice when just to, to... Yeah, when you don't have to structure it, is it going to be 42 minutes long? Is it going to be 22 minutes exactly. long? Well, that, that's yeah. what you see. Like, I, about the only thing I really watch on Amazon, I do look at it occasionally, but the thing I mostly watch is the Grand Tour. 
Mm. And one of the things I like about that is sometimes it's 57 minutes, sometimes it's in, you know 67 minutes, sometimes it's, they don't have to worry about the structure yeah, of exactly. making it a 42 minute hour. What a cool idea. Eh? Yeah, you I, know, I, make, I, make, it, make it what it wants to be. And you make it till it's finished. Well, you, you know, in commercial TV, we used to have to get it right to the frame. So whatever the subject was, it had to be this to, to the 25th of a second, exactly the same length as the program from the week before about right. a completely different thing. Yeah, it doesn't make sense, does it? Right. I mean, it just seems to be, I mean, that's like saying to an author, um, who's got the world's best book? Yeah, you know, just make sure you finish on page four twenty three. Yeah, you can't go any longer than that. Yeah, you know, I was talking to some people who worked on, um, you know, Discovery Channel and History Channel, those big international networks, and they were talking about things called a slot clock. That, that said, sounds disgusting. Yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, but, but it would be like so. So, like, say if you're talking about a slot that starts at eight p.m. on a Wednesday night. Yep. At 8, 12 p.m. on a Wednesday night, when you're somewhere into the second section after the first ad break, that's where the big climax would fall for the first act. Right. And then da 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 and the peril would come at such and such a time, and this and that, and da 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 So the format was actually not just within a particular show, it was actually within a particular time slot across all networks. And so they would commission things specifically to follow the 8 p.m. slot clock. <sighs> it frustrates me because... There are several programs that I've watched. For example, Criminal Minds. Love Criminal Minds. Uh -huh. But then when you could see that every single week, basically, a, a terrible crime was committed. Mm. They then discovered the person they thought it was, mm. who ended up not being the person. Uh, uh. They then actually found the real person who it was. Uh. But that was like after I realized maybe it was one season uh, that uh. was written like that. But it was the <laughs> same, Oh yeah, the same, what do you call it, through line yeah. every single yeah, yeah. week. And it's that like, was like the House thing. MD, eh? it's like 8.37, so someone says it's lupus. You know, I mean, it's, it's just it's boring. <laughs> and people, I think, actually know that it's boring, right? They, well, they obviously know it's boring, but they actually they have an instinct that it isn't, that it isn't trying very hard, you know, that it's just trying to play the same old, same old. That's where I respect the BBC on some levels for going yeah. two seasons. Yeah. We're done. Yeah. You know, Ricky Gervais is the perfect example. Yeah. Two seasons and Board we're done. Out. Whereas you have a look at, you know, like I used to watch The Walking Dead. I don't watch it anymore. It's got yeah. to a... And it's not that I... Well, no, maybe I did stop enjoying it, but the storylines seem to be either repetitive or gone to a place which is whereas if you make a they jump the shark yeah they jump the shark Fonzie um, or, or yeah so I think that I think everything has strengths and weaknesses and sometimes the strength is the weakness and the weakness is the strength and I think that whole two seasons of programs in the UK I mean people are left wanting more which is a good thing but also you know I, th I think it was a Faulty Towers 14 episodes either 12 mm, or 14 yeah. and I and I heard um the chief John Cleese say once because there's 14 stories if you look through all literature in the world there are 14 stories and every single story in the world wow. will be one of these 14 Heroes and that's why he said he wrote <laughs> they did 14 episodes because we've done it all we've done all the stories you know people think it sounds pretentious and I guess it does but I, you know it's art it is art. yeah absolutely you know I, I see what I do as art I try really hard to, to make it you know worth that label it, it should be it's capable of being that cinema is a fantastic medium yeah so you know let's let's not make crappy stuff let's actually find ways to do the best possible work we can you know, I mean it's it's a good aspiration we, we may not achieve it all the time but we should always try so your documentary Helen Kelly together mm. um, is the last is it 12 months the last year of Helen's yeah, life, yeah, yeah, give or take, months. ten months. Yeah. Um, how does that start? I don't mean the story. How does how does how does that concept come together to go? Hey, you're dying. Let's stick a camera in your face for the last ten months. Just like that, actually. Um, it was pretty much exactly that. I what it was was I knew Helen. I'd, I'd met her um, many years before that, and liked her. You know, she was she was a nice person. You know, and and kind of full that, of being. that comes through. I had lots of dealings with Helen Kelly. Well, yeah. several, but through media, yeah. watching her open up her home and stuff in the documentary yeah. comes through like you've never seen yeah. when she's at the front of a rally. Yeah, that's true. And I, I, I think, I mean, I, I can't think of a time when a public figure in New Zealand has been so kind of you know naked um, on screen. And that was free Helen. She she was extremely self possessed mm. in a way that made her extremely unself conscious. Mm. And I don't mean that in an arrogant way. I just mean that she there was never really any question about who she was. You know. And I think that's actually one of the really important reasons why the people that she engaged with, um, who desperately needed her help, yeah. were willing to trust her. Yeah. Just because she didn't feel like she was trying too hard. She didn't feel like she was faking it. Yeah, there's a great story where she was going, I mean, we won't do spoilers, but she was going along and talking to, uh, helping one of the um, wives of a forestry worker and the, uh, the, the wife 
basically said she realised that she was the right person when she saw her come in and sit down and play with the kids on the floor and just not try and not not wear a suit and not try and you know push push an agenda. Just kind of go, what do you need? Well, you know, Helen grew up um, in a pretty unusual circumstances, but but relatively working class, relatively poor. You know, mm. and and so I, I actually I had to sit down with Mary once and asked her, is it because of her background, you know, that 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 you guys felt you know, that you could relate to her, she could relate to you, that you trusted her. And, and Mary Ann said, no, nothing like that. It wasn't that. It was the fact that, I mean, you didn't feel like you'd go down to New World and find Helen working at the checkout. She, she wasn't like that. But mm-hmm. what she was, was real. You know, she was willing to just be real. Whereas what they usually encounter, uh, and I, I saw it happen after she explained it, is, is people kind of genuflecting to kind of, to try to, you know, do the right thing or not do the wrong thing or just, you know, just generally being kind of awkward and, and unsure how to behave. Mm-hmm. You know, you probably remember from the film, there's there's when we go to the Pike River, fifth anniversary it is. Is that when they're calling out the names or was that earlier yeah, no, on? Just, just after that. Okay. So, the, so the, the families had been up at the portal of the mine calling out the names. They went to Black Ball afterwards right. and there's this great gathering of the community there. And almost by instinct, like there was some kind of invisible herd call, everyone in a suit was all clustered together into this little knot. You know, they hadn't told, been told to, they just mm. did. They just kind of knew to do that, you know, and they were all standing there looking nervous. And meanwhile, Helen's kind of, you know, miles away sitting in the grass with the families, just it's sort of smiling, very unselfconscious, just very, very really with them, you know. That was really unusual. And uh, that, that was actually probably the answer to your initial question. That was what drew me to her. I, I noticed that. And I also noticed it in the way she spoke, you know, when she would talk about stuff. It never really felt like it was about stuff. It felt like it was about people. And I was just very fascinated in, in how that was or what she was doing that was making it feel like that because it was really unusual. I don't think there's another political figure in New Zealand history that's quite like that. And I just wanted to understand it better. I don't want to release any spoilers, but I do have quite a specific question about something towards the end of the movie. Hmm. Um, Towards the end of the movie, basically in that last scene, last scenes of the movie, uh, when she's in her bed, in her hospital bed, Hmm. people all around her, Hmm. and she's talking about we're going to go back down to Wellington and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Were you were you in the room at the time then? Were you filming? Yeah. That was you. Yeah. So I wanted to know more out of my. I'm interested than anything. Did did she realise that she was never going to be the person to go back to Wellington and do that when she was saying we? Was that like the royal we, or did she still have some belief at that point that perhaps she might be back on the steps of Parliament at some stage? It was funny, you know. For, I'd say for about the last six months of her life, whenever anyone would ask her what was going to happen, she'd say, "Oh, I've probably only got six months left." And this was going, you know, right until she died. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think. Perhaps she was in just a touch of denial about what was going to happen. She was and she wasn't. Like if you asked her rationally, she would know. But, you know, she was, she, look, to be honest, I think she was she was a bit scared um, about, not, not about dying, but just a little bit scared that she wouldn't quite get far enough. She wouldn't get some of these fights far enough so that the people would be able to continue and get there without her. Mm. And and so, yeah, she, she felt really uncomfortable about that risk and she was very, very sad about it. Um, and a little desperate about it here and there. Well, she wanted them to feel strong. So, you know, there was, there was, that was probably the only time, actually, I was ever with her where it felt like the way she was feeling and the, and the, way, the things she was saying didn't completely align. So she, there she, was, it was a bit incongruent there. There was like what she was saying wasn't the reality of what the world was for her. Not, not entirely, no. I, I think, you know, she, she wanted people to feel strong. And she was extraordinarily good at making pe- people feel brave. Um, it's an interesting, everyone says it, it's it's not actually 100% clear to me how exactly she did it, but she did, she really did. People just felt like it was possible to fight after they'd spent some time with her and, and did carry on and fight even after she was gone. She was formidable. Yeah. I had a run in with her, I'll tell you about that. <laughs> <laughs> <Joyce>. <laughs> um, but the other thing for me, I lost my mum 10, 11 months ago. Mm. And that those scenes towards the end mm. were very quite raw for me because of what, Bet. you know, you, you, you have that moment where you say to the person at the hospital, we'll see you tomorrow, and, you know, do you or don't you? You're not sure 100% whether you do. But the one part of the movie that brought me to tears, literally, was the judge. Mm. Um, can I tell that story? Is that no, okay? No, I don't, don't want to. No, no, so obviously she spent a lot of time in courts through her career. 
Yeah. She's obviously spent a lot of time fighting for people, sitting in the front row of a court with court cases going on, you know, for the rights of workers and stuff. Yeah. And at the end of this case, end of this, whatever it was, whatever the correct word is, um, the judge made a public statement thanking Helen Clark for her life and for her work and for what she's done. And you could just tell that that judge in that minute was almost doing... Uh, a farewell from the New Zealand system yeah. to this person who had been such a strong advocate for the worker, yeah. and when that 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 broke me watching the documentary because it's like I always think about um, like a haka at a funeral always really impacts me because it's an honouring thing, mm. you know. It's an and I when that judge who you know Helen seemed to be this person who was. Uh, you know, uh, a, a, a massive lefty and a, a quote unquote troublemaker, and would try and stick it up the courts if she could for the war. You know, so she <laughs> she could have been seen. By it's the funny judge. you say that because I don't agree with anything oh, you okay. just said. Well, no, that's good. Let's come back to it. But that's the that's the that's uh, she. The way I have not seen her, but the way that I imagine is that she could yeah. have been quite a lot of trouble for the courts. Yeah. And to have this person who's the head of the courts in that moment kind of go to honour her. Yeah. That was an amazing moment. Yeah. Yeah, wasn't it nice? And New Zealand's not too good at that kind of thing often, eh? We, we hesitate to say it, but I'm, I'm very glad he did. That's when it. when you're filming that, do you go, holy crap, this is gold? Uh, or are you yeah. so, are you just watching it no, going? No, I do, I do. You yeah. know, I, I mean, this film was unusual. My, my way of making films is unusual in that I, I work alone when I'm filming. So it's, I, you know, I don't really have anyone to nudge, you know, but yeah, no, you know, that, that happened often. You get the... Uh, the hairs on the back of your neck stand up and you go, that's going to be in the cut. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. not ending up on the floor. Oh, for sure. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So tell me what I had wrong about Helen. Um, okay. Well, I mean, the first thing that I found quite funny about her is she was quite a square. You know, she was um, pretty conservative personally. She was very, very all about hard work. And um, See, you, you, I'm just, I'm going to talk this through with you. Mm. You think about the, the political circle she ran in and the word conservative, they, they seem to be a juxtaposition. Because, I mean, I'm not saying she wasn't, but the, you, you would think about someone was that would be quite liberal hmm. and quite liberally minded. I think she, well, I think she was quite liberally minded, you know, when it came to you know policy positions on hmm. things. But I just mean her personal values were, I, I guess you'd call them quite traditional New Zealand working class values. You know, she, right. she worked hard. I mean, you know, when I first met her to talk about the film, which was the day after she'd left the CTU. I think it was the first day in her adult life, really, when she'd had no job. And she was actually, that was the main thing on her mind. It wasn't the fact that she was terminally ill. She was feeling kind of a bit weird about that. I think know? that's when she was sitting in the documentary at that table feeding the sparrows. I think she said then, this is the first day. Oh, no, that was, that was maybe maybe about a week or two later. Okay. But this was, this was before I was filming. I, I actually, um, I mean, the things I talked about before about what I liked about, or what I was interested in in Helen, you know, I, I liked her and I, and I thought those things were interesting and those, that just sat at the back of my head and then suddenly she announced she was dying. And I mean, you, you must remember when that news came out, it was quite quite big news and, yeah. and I, I, I found it really upsetting to a, to a degree that really surprised me. I mean, I wasn't super close to her, but I just, it just felt, it felt really unfair and really sad and just, you know, actually quite hard to believe because it just it seemed didn't seem right her, her life force was really strong and it felt like she was just kind of stepping into this threshold of making a, a, a much bigger impact in New Zealand than she already had to me anyway I, I mean you know there was talk about a political future and so forth and I think that was probably very likely and she was she she died of lung cancer she she well she did yeah and she never smoked it wasn't um yeah, I was just gonna ask different that's... different type of lung cancer there's two sorts apparently she had Crazy. the other one yeah, me, eh? Oh, <laughs> Fate is just not such right. A, such eh? a bugger sometimes. Um, but um, you know, she she was. So I, because of the, because of the fact she was going to die, suddenly it felt urgent. Suddenly it felt like you know it was time. And I think that feeling was kind of seized her as well. And you know, I, she had this monstrous kind of portfolio of causes and things that she could have spent that last year on, or yeah. indeed looking after herself was another yeah. possibility. But no, no one seriously thought that would happen. But you know. Um, and I, I think because of that framing, she, the, the things that she chose had this kind of slightly elevated sense of moral clarity about them. You know, she chose the ones that she thought were really important and quite symbolic, mm -hmm. and also the ones that where she really felt they needed her, you know, to help them kind of get over the line. And you know, the sad thing was, um, they none of them really had quite got over the line at the time that she. So died. she left un, undone work, so to speak. There oh, were still things to do. Oh, oh, well, I mean, Pike River was worse than that. 
Pike River was falling apart at the time that she died. You know, there'd, there'd been a negotiation going on quietly to, you know, have some form of settlement to yeah. her. But, um, Jesus, while she was in her hospice bed, the, the government of the day, the national government, just kind of pulled the rug and said, no, no, we're just not interested in that, and then just pulled the will, you know. That was the only time I actually really saw her upset. Not on camera, actually. She rang me up. She was just, she was crying. She really felt she'd failed them. And, and she didn't see how they would manage to do it without her. So, you know, that was very sad. Um, was there any reason why we didn't see funeral footage or uh, towards the end? Yeah. Um, I didn't think we needed it. Okay. I, I, I mean, I, <laughs> the story I, was finished. The story isn't. The story actually goes on just a little bit past there, but I, I kind of feel. You know, it's, I don't see this as a film about Helen Kelly's death. I see it as a film about her life. You know, and and that's that might sound like playing with words, but actually for me that's quite an important distinction. Mm. And I, I, I felt like you got the idea, and and what was more important to do was to pick up the sense of the momentum of her life force, and and her co papa had that that sort of flowed on to things that happened afterwards. Yeah, the film is very nearly finished at the time that she dies, but I just went a little bit further because I wanted to, I wanted to show that it wasn't. It wasn't hopeless. It wasn't kind of like a glorious defeat for the things that she'd been fighting for. Uh, many of them are still in the wind and not finished, but there, there's there's people fighting. Did she see any rough cuts or rough edits of anything you'd done? No. No, it, that, that came much later. Um, I, but I did what I did do probably oh, a month or two before she died is we had a nice sit and a cup of tea and I, I told her about it and I told her about how I saw the film going and, and what I thought it would be. And she was very happy about that. She, mm. she was very pleased. She didn't want the film to be about her. <laughs> it is, actually. So well, she, Helen she, Kelly together, she didn't want it to be about Helen Kelly. Not really. Well, she had this, <laughs> she had this interesting <laughs> philosophy about that. You know, she said, it's not about leadership. Don't make that mistake. And, and I said, what do you mean, Helen? She said, who's the head of Amnesty International? And I said, I don't know. This felt like some kind of lefty general knowledge chest. I had no idea. Right? <laughs> she said, nobody knows and, and nobody cares. It's, yeah. it's not important. It's about the values of that organisation and what it does in the world. You know, and... And she she saw her causes as being the same. I don't think it's quite as simple as that, but I understand what No, because what she's she not. But 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 she's still the one bringing those causes together. It's not like there's a bigger group who is she's. I mean, like she was part of the CTU, hmm. but she was out of the CTU when she was doing those yeah, other causes. Was. So in yeah. other words, it is her. Yeah, she is the Amnesty International in this example. Uh, I, I don't know, nah, not as far as she was concerned. Well, she, but, that, but but no, maybe not as far as she's concerned. Well, actually, actually, actually but she is. What, what? Because well, she no, because well, yeah. no, no, because she, if Amnesty International is the group doing the work, hmm. in the story towards the end of her life, she is the group doing the work. Well, what she would have said is that she um she 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 went to people who had an injustice in their life and and helped them to fight for themselves. Yeah, and she meant it quite literally. She would like she would ask them what they needed. She would provide them with some options. She would provide them with any support she could. But basically, it was their fight, and she was very respectful of it. I thought it was a little bit, um, you know, it's an inefficient way. Sometimes you're asking people to make decisions who have no experience in how to have that kind of fight, where she had lots. But mm -hmm. actually, I, I, you know, as time passes, I, I, I really see the wisdom in it. You know, it has to be their fight. I mean, if you look at Pike River now, you know, I mean, that, that fight has been pretty magnificent mm -hmm. uh, in many ways, but it has been Anna Osborne and Sonia Rockhouse's fight on behalf of the wider family group. Um, and it's been true to them. And there's been a number of points in it where it's had to be quite a deep question for them about what's important and what isn't, you know, that they've had to, that they've had to choose. If anyone else had chosen for them or, if, you know, if they'd just been sort of swept through it, um, I'd, I think it would have failed by now. I um as I said I spoke to her several times working in radio. I worked in news and current events mm. for the best part of ten years. Mm. Um, <laughs> I saw her wrath once when uh, I did like a daily panel mm. on a talk show, mm. and I had all sorts of contributors to that daily panel, mm. uh, all sorts of profile newsmakers and stuff, and one of them was Cam Slater. So Cameron <laughs> Slater was a um, was a contributor. He used to come on occasionally, way a little for people who don't know. Yeah. And if you Google, I'm, I'm I'm not saying I'm proud of this or it's a good thing, but if you Google my name and Helen Kelly, you'll probably come across some of the audio yeah. from that moment <laughs> because it was a Ports of Auckland dispute. When was that? Oh, 2011. Right, 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 right. Probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Cameron and his, um, in his way hmm. made some statements and made some calls and had his research pointing towards a particular individual 
within the ports um, of Auckland dispute you know, being dishonest or whatever it was mm. and that came up on the show and I had a very quick phone call or well, my producer did explaining <laughs> basically explaining to us that um, we're not allowed to have Cameron on the radio anymore <laughs> <laughs> and um, failure of diplomacy there <laughs> no, oh, you know what but the thing about that is the thing that I really respected about it and still do I mean I've written a, if you Google those things you'll come across the piece including the answer phone message, message she left me um, is that she, you know, we said, come on, come on, we'll talk it out, and, you know, it's radio. I want to I want to have these conversations on here. And said all the way through that I was never around. Oh, there you go. Thanks, Ooh. Jace. <laughs> Thanks, Jace. I don't know if we want to play, play um, Helen's answer. I'm very concerned message. about the interview that you did with um, Whale Oil this morning. I think he uh, uh, slandered one of our members and got the facts completely wrong. It was live on radio. Obviously, you're liable for that as well. I think it's an incredibly serious uh, pretty, pretty matter direct that you're talking lady. about. Yeah. He was being sacked for uh, intimidation and violence. It's just completely untrue. And we're very disappointed that you continue to give this guy space <laughs> on the radio show. So she may have had a point. <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe. maybe. I, I guess the point from my side of things is, and, and that article actually talks about it, is I'm not an anti-union person. In fact, I've, I've been in enough trouble um, supporting the unions, writing pieces in support of the NZDI and having them then use it. It was an individual story about an individual union. But, but you know, the thing was, she's not there saying to you, I didn't like the fact that you had an anti-union guy on. She's saying she didn't like the fact that this guy came on and said stuff that wasn't true. Um, that's, that's, a different, that's a different argument. Yeah, it's when you're a broadcaster, I guess, and you've got people with evidence in front of you, one saying one thing, one saying the opposite, you as a broadcaster go, well, let's talk this out. I suppose. And yeah. that's what we wanted to do. I mean, I, I made sure very carefully that I had my ass covered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in that, in that instance, I, I disagreed with some of the stuff that the ports of Auckland were doing. Mm. Uh, sorry, the union were doing. And, mm. and in other cases, I supported the union, like I said, with um, NZDI when um, national standards come in. I supported mm. the union there. So I'm not a pro or anti. I'm, I look mm. at the individual situation. But it was and, – and Gary Parslow, who was a part of um, – part of what they were doing I think at the time we had him on the newsroom used to joke there that they um, that they were going to give him his own show he was on so much yeah. Um, yeah. but what I got from that is the fo- she was formidable she was and she was she she spoke her mind and yeah. we connected with her and it was always like come on tell us what you want to do we're, we're, we're happy to retract mistakes show us and yeah. we'll do it yeah. Um, but yeah she was a pretty Oh, she, she, she she was direct. She was, and she didn't muck around. But yeah. I tell you what, you know, she played the ball and not the man. You know, overwhelmingly, mm-hmm. she she had very few enemies. You know, even even people from all over the political spectrum. You know, she was very friendly with, and, mm-hmm. and sincerely, it wasn't just kind of you know rapport stuff. She was actually she was. Um, she had a few people she didn't like. She didn't get on well with Jerry Brownlee because he called her a a, a, um, a liar on TV. Oh, really? And, and then then afterwards said it was all a game. You know, um, she. Uh, I would imagine she'd be the kind of person that say that wouldn't take the idea of playing games very well because to her it's real life and these people are real and their problems are real. I imagine that she wouldn't want to be a game player. Well, you know, something that I, I find sad about New Zealand politics, a change that seems to have happened, is that we, we seem quite, we seem to be quite willing to kind of, you know, join a team and and, and think that that's what it's all about. Mm. You know, when actually, I don't think that's, even, even Helen, I don't think she quite saw it like that. I think she, she thought it was about the merits of the argument. I, it, I agree. I, I mean, think that's absolutely what it's about. Yeah. I mean, we've talked on this podcast before and actually that, interaction I had with Helen which then flowed into an interaction with um, Bomber Bradbury which then flowed into an interaction with other people caused me to write a piece which was ideology versus intelligent debate in other words playing the ball because I think as human beings we have to say we're never going to be 100% wrong and often an ideologue and I'm not suggesting any one of those people are Hmm. but will always think that their argument is correct whereas sometimes maybe the opposing view might be the one yeah. That's right, because we can't. I mean, who would say I'm always right? No well, one. Well, I'm, well, no, some people do, right? I mean, well, but, they're but, out there. But, and then when you're playing the ball, mm. that means you go for the argument, not mm. the ideology behind you or the argument. But I, I think the New Zealand kind of variation on that is we, we tend to align ourselves with Team A or Team B. Well, that's, and, and if you have a look, for example, to international, this guy. Such fake news. 
um, mm-hmm. offshore. Yeah, that's that's happening more yeah. and more and more yeah. and more and more. And it's a complete quagmire. It's tribal. I mean, it's it's a it's a terrible tar pit, and we have to watch that because I think we have a cultural weakness for it. Right? Yeah. We we our kind of our, our our quest towards homogeneity goes back many many years. Yeah. You know? We have to be willing. If that's something Helen was always willing to do. She she didn't care whether everyone in the agreed, room agreed with her or no one in the room agreed with her. She'd listened to what their arguments were, but if she was confident, she was she was quite happy. It was a really interesting part of the doco as well. I think it was the forestry workers. Mm. She was sitting in a hall and they were all wearing green singlets. Mm. And obviously there'd been action, strike action for quite a while. Oh, and there was concern. Workers. Was that yeah. meat workers? Was yes, okay. Yes. And it looked like actually they were all pretty pissed with either her or the situation and she was getting a bit of blowback from that mm. and she just seemed so calm mm. and talked it out so calmly mm. and mm. you know knew what needed to be done and then at the end of it she obviously stayed there until every person had left because there was a shot in the in the thing where she was in one chair with one person mm. and then one of the females came up and gave her a big hug and walked off so it seemed that it i mean i i don't know if that was the feeling in the room but what i read in the documentary was there was a bit of gruffness in the room and some of it was being aimed at her because maybe the answers weren't quite there that they wanted. Well, I, th- I think there was kind of a, a hope that she would have some sort of magic ability to to change reality. And she for actually them. said that she said, "I've got no magic answer here." I think yeah. in that part of the documentary, yeah. and she didn't. I mean, you know, I mean, New Zealand corporates are very powerful. That had to do with the Tallies family and the, the Tallies owned um, meatworks, yep. um, AFCO Meatworks. You know, and even when court or the court was instructing them that things were illegal, they were still just kind of kicking it down the road and with legal manoeuvring. Tell you something, you know, the the, the dispute that you see in the film. This yep. was shot in two th- early two thousand and sixteen, uh, following a, a lockout that lasted more than a hundred days and was found to be illegal. Uh, the court ruled that those workers should be paid for the time they were locked out. The agreement to do that was agreed last weekend. So this whole time, it's been kind of wow. just kicked further and further down the road. Now you know you have a you have a, a multi millionaire family um, on one side of that, and you have a bunch of very very poor meat workers in Wairoa on the other side of that. You know where's the power in that relationship? Yeah. I think that's that's. I I really hope that that's that this is how people can respond to Helen's story and and reflect on on this film. It shouldn't be about yay union. It should be about we believe in certain things in our society that should be bigger than you know where you sit politically it should be you know justice for example surely mm. that's not a political issue mm. well it shouldn't be well it, it shouldn't be and, and then and, but then when you hear and i'm pretty sure i heard this you'll correct me if i'm wrong mm. something along the lines of it is cheaper or easier for a, a company to let someone die than spend the money on making them safe i think it was about a forestry yeah, this was Helen saying that. Was that Helen saying that? Yes, it was. And, and then you think about what you've just said about, um, you know, justice it shouldn't be that way, but it seems that it is. I, I think a, a very important, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard, you know, it's difficult to get to grips with this because it feels so dark. Mm. But I think the real realistic situation is that if you are, um, you know, a company, you're sitting on a board of directors and you have a million things to worry about and a million risks to juggle, whether you're going to invest hard-earned money, hard, you know, slice of your potential profit mm. into into boring stuff like you know high-vis vests or more expensive stuff like you know mechanising your manual forest crew, for example, whether you will or you won't is is partly going to have to do with an analysis of risk. If there isn't risk in hurting or killing people that will affect your bottom line, yeah, wow. then then it's quite likely to affect the decision you make. I mean, that's that sounds horrible, but I think it's actually the truth. Well, that's a little bit like I'm thinking about the um, Brad Pitt movie, Fight Club. Fight, Fight Club, Fight Club. Fight Club. Has on, has on that, I was about to button the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Where he talks about the insurance risk, and if they work out that there's going to be 10% of the cars fail, or whatever the example is, and the payoff that that would have to be, or the payouts that those would have to be, is less than actually changing the fault, then they don't change the fault. Yeah, and you know, I think one of the things that the film makes very clear, and it was new territory for me, I was amazed and really disturbed to discover it, is that the fact is, in New Zealand right now, if your company, if my business, I'm a business owner, if your mm-hmm. business kills someone, you're pretty unlikely to actually end up finding yourself in court about that. You know, even if it's reasonably clear that you've broken the law, the fact is um, there are very, very few prosecutions uh, for, for workplace death in New Zealand, extraordinarily few. In the period that Helen was focusing on uh, in the forest industry, there had been 900 serious injuries and deaths 
of workers mm. and 12 prosecutions. Was it like it was something like 48 deaths? Yeah, yeah, in that in that region. Sorry, I don't yeah. know the number exactly, yeah. but about that number. I mean, forestry is the, by a factor of seven the the most most likely to kill you work in New Zealand. So that they're our deadliest catch. Uh, well, they well they're, they're quite a small industry. Actually, yeah. the, the the one that kills the most people is agriculture and in particular tractors and quad bikes. Right. But the the one that uh, is most likely to kill you as an individual worker is definitely forestry by miles. If Helen Kelly was sitting here, and it's probably unfair to ask this, because um, as someone who's not involved in that world, but basically has never been involved in that world, mm. let's use the example of the um, fluoro vests on the 19-year-old cutting down trees. Mm. You've got the board here. Mm. You've got probably the regional director here. Mm. You've got the head of the site here. Mm. You've got the head of the team here. You've got the 19-year-old who doesn't have his fluoro vest on here. How, what is the way that the blame should be apportioned up in the in the scale of who is responsible? Like if there is a if there is a vest available and it's just not being worn, is that still to blame? You still hold these guys responsible, or do you have any idea about how that works or an opinion on that? Yeah, um, I I think that it's well within the ability of senior leadership and organisations to determine things that happen on the ground. And mm -hmm. if it isn't, then they really need to, to fix that because there's a bunch of things they're responsible for about what happens on the ground. I mean, if I'm the head of McDonald's and someone in my McDonald's restaurant likes to hurl racist ab abuse as they serve their hamburgers, I mean, that you know, I, I'm, I'm going to make sure that that will never happen, right? Yeah. It's, it's much the same as far as I'm it's concerned. It's a, like... Um, in my work, I've been on sites, you know, lot, lots of industrial sites, filming and so forth. And and um, one thing I've seen with health and safety is most of them, you always go through a health and safety briefing beforehand. You know, mm. you get your fluoros, you have to do a thing for like an hour, so you have to factor that into your schedule of the day. But the ones that are always the safest are the ones where it's like ingrained into the culture mm. of that company. Um, safety first is like their primary thing. Even if they're doing like a, uh, a corporate mm. video to promote to investors, it's like we're safety first. Mm. And if it's ingrained in the culture, then every person, even the, the little temp guy that came in from one of those trade staff companies, um, they, if they're work, the person they're working with, if they're not wearing their fluoros, that person's going to call them out as if they were their boss. Well, let me give you an example. Can I give you a practical example? Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, it's, it's one thing New Zealand culture seems to be extraordinarily prone to and quite enthusiastic about is blaming victims when things go yeah, wrong. Yeah, for sure. I mean, for one thing, they're dead and they don't argue back, right? Yeah. So it's kind of convenient for everybody. But I think... In forestry, uh, it's very clear statistically that uh, a forest crew is much safer if it's mechanised, right? The new technology allows people to more or less operate, do everything from inside the machines. The old model is there would be particularly young people in amongst the trees as they're being felled, right? So they're much more likely to be hurt. Mm -hmm. A portion, perhaps half, slightly more of our forestry crews are now mechanised and the rest still aren't. Now, for that to be acceptable, for that to still, for it still to be viable that a company will be hired to do that work without that much safer work practice, mm -hmm. that's in the hands of the people who are writing the tender documents that, that choose the forest contracting company to come and cut their trees down. Right. It's, it's probably within the, within the hands of the shareholders to even insist. Um, and the so, shareholders so are the, all across New Zealand. The tender, the person who's accepting the tender could just pick the mechanised over the... Yep. Over the other. They could say, you must have a safety record above this high threshold. Yep. They, they could say, you must have this level of equipment. You know, you must undertake not to work in the dark or work in the rain or work in, you know, but gale force that, But that's when business also puts value on lives and safety because they'll go, yeah. if we use this mechanised group, we're going to pay 10% more than if we use yeah, the that's non. Right. So it, that's, it costs that's, money, right? Yeah, like yeah. it costs hard, proper money to do yeah. these things. And you might say, well, what's the chances, right? The chances are, are, are maybe not super high that any given, you know, crew on any given day is going to kill someone mm. but there's no doubt that if everyone makes that decision across New Zealand then mm. people will die every week so it, it is something that senior managers can prevent I mean that's why they paid the big money right yeah so it, that they can do it and and we could easily make that more likely by making the consequences higher and, and more likely to happen and I guess if it starts at the top down if the expectation from the board or the CEO or whatever is if you ain't got your freaking vest on you know 19 year old on day one then you ain't going to have a job is the culture you can set up in the in the company as well. Oh, fully. And I'll tell you what, I mean, if you get to the stage where an individual board member might find themselves being paid, 50, you know, fined $50,000 because a worker died, I think you'll find a lot will change. You know, in places where that has happened, a lot has changed. Yeah. 
there was a fruit juice company uh, last week, I think, in Napier, who who were uh, fined four hundred thousand dollars after killing a worker. Um, it, it's good that they were fined that amount, and no doubt that company will definitely take that more seriously going forward. But you know, the machine that killed that worker was identified the year before by WorkSafe as being non-compliant and dangerous, and it wasn't fixed. And where does, this is the, Jason's just got it up for us, Hawke's yeah. Bay Fruit Juice Company, out of interest, where does that money go? Oh, that'll go to the government. That'll go back into the Consolidated Fund. I so think. what about um, Manpreet Carl, who was the guy who was killed? Hmm. This is with ACC and all that. He's just, I guess, his family gets... There, there is a slice of it that goes to the family. Right. Yeah. But, you know, another thing New Zealanders tend to do is we think that if any money goes to anyone, then they're a bit dirty by it. You know, the Pike River families get this all the time. You know, that you would have seen in the film that WorkSafe did a deal with uh, the insurers of Peter Whittle, mm. where basically they paid over three and a bit million dollars and, and uh, they dropped the charges. In fact, they didn't just drop the charges. They actually did a particular legal manoeuvre that meant the charges couldn't be relayed. Um, and, and not only did he not get charged, but he actually, you know, he didn't have to plead. It wasn't like a plea deal. He didn't, he didn't, he never, no admission of guilt. I was doing talkback at the time, I think. Um, I double checked that, I'm not sure. But I remember thinking, because Peter Woodle at the start was being talked about for a, a freaking sainthood, certainly. A he, he was nominated for New Zealander of the Year. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, guys, just chill. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So this dude is in charge of this business. Yeah. And 29 people have died. Yeah. And because he said nice things on camera, everyone thinks he's a he's up for a knighthood. And the things why he don't said were just bullshit. Why don't we like, just wait? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, when, it's did, like, when did that happen? When did the. When did the which part? The when did Pike River? When did the mine go? No, November two thousand and ten. Yeah, okay. So I was yeah. I was still doing talkback. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And you know what the 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 negotiation? He, the, so the insurance company paid three point something million dollars. It got split up across the twenty nine families and put in their bank accounts without them knowing anything about it until they looked at their bank balance the next day. Now people think, oh, they got a hundred thousand dollars each. They, you know. <laughs> That's that's lucky for them. They didn't want it, you mm. know. I mean, it was it was that they ended up in a situation where nobody ever faced a court for what had happened to their men. Still hasn't. Mm. Well, that, that's kind of like the you know throwing back to a good, good old classic film, the 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 Aaron Brockovich thing. Is that they they were offered you know a huge amount of money for work though. Those those people were offered saying you know let's just you know take this money, mm. you have a good life, yeah. you know you can enjoy the last few days you've got. Yeah. And then she convinced them said no. They need to be a. You need to get more money. B. They need to be held accountable so it doesn't happen again. You know. But but you know, step step back from the money and just consider what's actually being done. Th th these you, you you can actually come up with a sum of money that means you don't get prosecuted over the deaths of twenty nine people. Yeah, well, that's what the, often you see in those even in those criminal shows you're talking about before is that it's like we'll give you one million dollars, but it needs to be um, a settlement, you know, a closed settlement, so nothing ever gets out, and we don't. There's no liability. We will not admit wrong. Sign the NDA. You know, sign yeah, the NDA. Also, you never talk about it. It's like okay, well. Are you going to do anything about it? How, how again? did it and, ever you know. occur to a government department that that would be a legitimate thing to do? I mean, I, I just find that incredible. And not only did that happen, but it was actually it got through several layers of the court before mm. the Supreme Court finally said that is clearly unlawful, <laughs> right? I mean, you can't buy your way out of killing people in New Zealand. No, other parts of the world maybe so. Yeah, maybe if a glove doesn't fit. Yeah. Um, but not in not in New Zealand. Yeah. Hey, um, we've got another podcast due in about twenty five minutes, yeah. so we can next time you're down, we can talk again. Obviously, awesome. love to. Yeah. Um, couple of things. Hmm. Have you been more uh, turned on to, more interested now in what Helen was about and the fights she was fighting? Is that still now in you? Or was that always in you? Uh, I was, you know, I was kind of, I was probably quite interested in several of the things that she was interested in, but it's become much more um, concrete. Mm. You know, that was that was special about Helen, from my point of view. And you know, I said before, the question was, why was it that she spoke in this different way about these issues? They sounded different when she spoke about them. Mm. I think the reason why they sounded alive and they sounded full of people is because she actually knew the people that these things were happening to, in a really unusual way. She would just simply. She would give give them a ring. She'd she'd email them, and she'd go and you know sleep on their couch and get to know them and and actually enter their lives, and allow them to enter hers. She didn't have that big boundary that the rest of us all seem to think we need between what we do in our personal lives and what we do in our professional lives. Mm. She, and, and somehow she managed to do that without it killing her or squashing her flat. I found all of that 
very personally um, challenging and, and have, have found that my, that my own kind of ethical defences for not doing the same, I, actually they've, they've really fallen over. So it has changed the way that I've lived in oh, that cool. respect in quite a, quite a deep way. You know, I've got to know a lot of those people and, you know, to, to a degree I've got involved with, at, at Pike River to try to help a little bit with, with what they've been continuing to do and, and, and remain friends with all of those people. They all came to the premiere in Wellington a mm. couple of weeks ago, which was magnificent. You know, we all had dinner together and they stayed at my place and it was cool. It was nice. Yeah, it is. It is nice. We need to actually just go and and meet people. Well, there I am. There I am. I think, yeah. <laughs> That's not the most flattering of pictures. <laughs> 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 Yeah, um, I guess the the question that everyone wants to know now is uh, also because we talked about it beforehand, what's going to happen tonight at Eden Park? That's the big question. <laughs> Just, no, no, that's the big question, the real question. <laughs> I don't know, mate. I don't know. The All Blacks are looking vulnerable. I think that's good for the All Blacks, eh? Historically, uh, you know, we're not we're not very well suited to being Australians, where we just always think we're going to win everything. It suits us better to be a bit more on the edge, I think. They'll, I'm sure they'll they'll recover magnificently. I think it's going to whatever happens. And I love rugby, but mm. I'm not one of these people who screams at the TV and gets that upset if we lose. No. Like, I mean, I, but I love the game. I think whatever happens tonight is going to be a cracker. Yeah. It's going to be a cracker of a yeah, game. Yeah. And apparently the weather's not very good, and I wonder if that'll help the ABs a bit more. Oh, than, perhaps, yeah. Than, the Aussies will get all Of course, down here in Dunedin, it's always beautiful and fine and sunny. No, it is. I've, I've really noticed that since <laughs> I've been here, actually. It's tropical down here. And everyone. four degrees. <laughs> uh, and now, finally, finally, finally. Um, the documentary yeah. is Helen Kelly Together. Yes. We kind of started talking about this, but I don't think we actually finished it off. If people want to see it, mm. it's due for release in 2020, is that right? Uh, well, that's, that's our aspiration. But I have to say, New Zealand's not an easy place to release serious documentaries in. Um, I've already talked about TV. Um, we are really hoping to pull off a large-scale um, release in cinemas all across the country so mm -hmm. that it can reach lots of people. I should say it is still running uh, in the New Zealand Film Festival all across New Zealand. We've still got about 26 screenings of it from one end of the country to the other. Oh, it's good. in a, you know, a dozen different places. So there is an opportunity to see it. But we hope in early 2020 we might be able to bring it back and, and you know, really really reach out and, and, and put some strength to the elbow of people who feel like, uh, you know, Helen's legacy speaks to them, which I think is a lot of New Zealanders. What's the International Film Festival website there, Jace? I can't see the URL. Is it nziff? Nziff, yeah. Dot .co.nz alright so nziff.co.nz there's mm. the documentary there mm. so people can find it you say 26 still remaining mm, that's right so it's good. and actually I didn't even realise this myself but the film festival goes all over the place now it's filming it's, you know, it's from Gore to, to uh, Tauranga to Hamilton to, you're just all over the country it's a great documentary thank you mate. you should be really proud and it's the um, it's a story that needs to be told and I think for many of us who have only seen Alan Kelly only saw Helen Kelly in the news media or spoke to her from a news perspective. Mm. It's um, it's a, a fascinating look, and I think um, well done. Thank you, mate. And can I just say I have tried really hard to make sure that this film doesn't exclude anybody. I think this is a film for all New Zealanders. Mm. However, whatever you feel your politics are, this isn't a film about that. This is a film about justice and about who we are as a people and who we want to be going forward. So I, I, I really hope everyone will feel included and embraced by by the way that this tells the story. Yep. There is also a Facebook page. There is, yep. Just is it just Helen Kelly Together? I'm told to say hashtag Helen Kelly Together on any social media you'll find us. And and actually one thing we'd really like people to do is to come and join up. And if they have some ideas or energy to bring to its later distribution, we'll, we'll use that. And we'll, we, you know, we want to work with people to try to reach communities who ought to see this and ought to think about it. Are there um, other film festivals around the world? Yeah, there certainly are. Um, and there's there's other stakeholders around the world who have, have expressed an interest. Well, there's a horrible word, stakeholder. I mean, there's there's people out there who responded to Helen. Helen, you know, she was on the, the board of the ILO, the International Labour Organisation. She was, nobody knows this in New Zealand. You know, when the refugee crisis first really hit hard in mm -hmm. Europe, she was a very important voice in trying to protect those people from being just completely taken advantage of by unscrupulous employers all across Southern wow. Europe. And, and did play a really important part in that outcome for them. So she's known over yet, over there, and we're, we're hopeful that they'll be interested in this as well. All right. Thank you again. Thank you for the documentary. It's amazing. Thank you. And I think everyone should definitely see it, either in the film festival now or whatever outlet it has in early 2020. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but keep an eye out for it. Tony Satorius, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, mate.